Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. This is a special South by Southwest 2018 edition of Fast Forward. We are here at the ACC, and we're talking to some of the leaders and pioneers in the digital space. Uh, I have one of those pioneers with me right now. It is Rana El Kalubi, the CEO of Effectiva, and we're going to talk about how computers and machines can read our emotions, why that's important, and what are some of the implications of them doing so. Rana, thanks so much for, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So Affectiva is a company that is built to help machines understand our emotions. Why is that an important thing for machines to be able to do? Yeah, so emotions matter. I mean, our, our emotions influence how we do everything. It's how we connect and communicate with one another, how we make decisions, how we learn. Um, it affects our mental health and our well-being. So emotions are just very important. And if you actually look at intelligence, so we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, and if we look at human intelligence, it's not just about cognitive intelligence, it's about emotional intelligence. So your EQ really matters. And people who have higher EQ tend to be more likable, they're more persuasive, they're, they do better in their professional and personal lives. And we think as technology becomes more conversational and perceptual and such a fundamental part of, of our everyday lives that it also needs to have emotional intelligence or what we call emotion AI for short. So uh, how exactly do the computers learn how to do this? Like you started off working with facial recognition, right? Exactly. Yeah. So again, if we look at how humans do it, about 55% of, uh, of, of our in inferring other people's expressions and mental states and social states is read through facial expressions and gestures. I, I do a lot of facial expressions and gestures, so I'm probably like uh, more than 55%. Um, and then 38% is in your tone of voice, so how you say things. Um, your pitch, how fast you're speaking, your, um, your voice quality, and then only 7% is in your choice of words. Mm. So the entire industry of sentiment analysis is just focused on that 7%, and 93% of the data is just lost in cyberspace. So we're trying to bring back the 93% first by, I mean, we've been doing facial expression analysis for over seven, eight years now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and most recently we added speech as well so that you can be interacting with your phone or your car or your social robot and it can read and understand your emotions both through, by watching you but also hearing you. So it seems like that we've reached a point where the technology to do this is already in place. So many devices have cameras built into them. We're, I'm in front of an iPad right now that theoretically could be reading my facial expressions and creating an index on that. Um, how is that, uh, you know, what are gonna, some of the applications going to be? It seems to me call centers would be a great uh, place for this. I mean, maybe you don't have the camera, maybe you do have the camera, mm -hmm. but you're, you know, you can help an automated system read the person on the other end of the phone's emotional uh, temperature. Exactly. I mean, we've all been in situations where you're talking to an automated agent and you're just like so frustrated and it's obvious, right? Like you're angry, you can hear it in people's voice, um, but this thing has no idea, right? And so that's a great use case where it could either kind of acknowledge your emotion, your anger, or, or even escalate it or kind of delegate it to, a, to an expert human being. And then the, uh, when you start talking about the research, and, and I know we can't talk about specific Effectiva clients, but in the automotive space, yeah. a number of uh, car manufacturers have, have talked about how excited they are to have cars that can read our emotional responses. And I think that's like a leap that a lot of consumers are like, why, why is my car, why does my car need to know that I'm angry? Yeah. And, and how is that going to help me? Yeah, we think of it, and you're right, like the, the automotive space is undergoing major disruption so fast, like we didn't even kind of anticipate that to be a big market for Affectiva. Um, but we think of it as a continuum. If you think of the kind of everything from the cars we drive today through semi-autonomous vehicles, through fully autonomous vehicles, um, there is a need for understanding the drivers and the occupants. So in, I'll give you an example. In the semi-autonomous world, the car is kind of driving itself, but it will sometimes need to relinquish control back to a driver because it kind of it comes across a situation and it has no idea how to respond, and now it needs a human driver in the loop. Well, is the driver awake? Is the driver distracted? Uh, is he or she paying attention? And, and the only way the car can know that if there is in-cabin sensing through a camera or a microphone and it can detect things like you know, drowsiness or fatigue or cognitive load or intoxication is a big one. Um, so that's in the world where we're monit there's still a driver. Um, that's in the world where there's still a driver or a co-pilot. Um, 
but if you kind of project that into the future of robo taxis where you know we we get into a vehicle and there's no driver you still want the car to understand you know are you nauseous are you stressed are you frustrated um, are you enjoying the experience can i customize and personalize the content the music movies the games so we, we kind of think of cars as becoming entertainment hubs um, and also conversational interfaces, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, we, um, we, we kind of didn't anticipate that this would be happening so fast, but we are working with a number of major car manufacturers around the world, really, to bring that to market. Are there, what are some of the other applications that you, you didn't expect when you first started this um, a couple of years ago now yeah. um, that have sort of surprised you? I would say the ones that I'm most passionate about, um, and it's going to take a lot of work, but, but, we, but we have data that indicates that it's, it's, it's very viable, is mental health. So, um, you know, we check our phones at least 15 times an hour. It's insane. And, and every time we do that, that's an opportunity to, un, to take a, a kind of a checkpoint on your mental health and, and establish a baseline for who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you deviate from that baseline, um, there are facial and vocal biomarkers of depression and even red flags for suicidal behavior um, that we could detect on your face. And so I'm very interested in leveraging technology to, as an early indicator for depression um, or kind of suicide assessment. Because the gold standard today is you ask people. It's so unreliable. Yeah, we are unreliable narrators right. by definition. and, and I think that you know this is why people go to therapy is to have a better understanding of their mental and emotional lives because we don't always notice it. Right, exactly. But the camera will maybe able to notice it and, and offer a more truthful account. So in, in terms of mental health and monitoring mental health, what are the data privacy implications to collecting that data and then who gets exposed to that data? Right. Yeah, and that's a really crucial question. Um, everything we've done as a company so far has required opt-in. And then I'm a strong believer that this is your data. You should, you should definitely have control over it and you should have control over who gets to see it. Um, that, that could be, you know, that could be um, a family member. It could be, you could give permission for that data to be shared with a clinician. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's kind of interesting. There's been research done, not by us, but at USC, where they have, they, they ran a controlled study for depressive patients. Um, in one case, you got a human psychologist or a psychiatrist, and in the other, you got an avatar. And they found that people were more open to, sh like they're just more transparent with the avatar than they were with the humans because the humans were judging them, but the avatar wasn't. Mm -hmm. So it opens all these interesting questions around. There's been around. studies with PTSD treatments right. and therapies as well, right. uh, where soldiers have find it easier to open up in a virtual world right. than they do in a, in a more human, uh, right. with human interactions. Right, because an avatar is not going to judge you, right? Or a robot's not going to judge you. And so, I, I, yeah, there are very interesting both ethical and data implications. And I do think that as a, as a tool, if it can be a tool for personal empowerment, yeah. tremendous amount of information and data that could be used just to help you govern your life. Yeah, I mean, imagine, imagine if you had like a Fitbit equivalent that's tracking your mood, right? Every time you're you're on your phone or your tablet, it's collecting all that information, and then it's synchronizing it with your calendar. So now it can tell you, you know, that Monday, you know, standing meeting with your boss, like you always leave stressed or frustrated, or, and it can just give you more insight. It's like you haven't smiled for five days in a row, like. So this is your company and this is your business, and, but, you, but I mean, how effective are these cues? Like, I, I mean, is, there, is it 50% effective, 75% effective? Like, how confident are you that you're getting the emotional reading right, or the machine is? Yeah, so, so the way this works is we use deep learning and a ton of data. So we collect data from around the world, the diversity of the data is really, really important to avoid bias in the algorithms. So we make sure that it's gender diverse, ethnically diverse, um, contextually diverse. So we have people on their phones, but also people in their cars or playing games or in their living rooms. All that data is fed into the deep learning networks. And then we compare the accuracy of the algorithm to expert human coders. So we have a team of labelers or you know, certified face readers mm -hmm. that spend eight hours a day going through videos and saying, huh, you know, I see a smile here or a smirk. And part of that data becomes training and part of that is how you, validation. How do you find those humans? Do you train those humans? 
or, or the like, coders, yeah. the labelers. Yeah, yeah. Um, they ha you have to get certified. So I guess the core, the basic skill is you have to have a little bit of empathy and a little bit of EQ. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you go through 100 hours of training where you learn to look for really minute expressions. Um, and, and there's a facial action coding system. Mm -hmm. So every facial muscle has a code. Like the smile is action unit 12. Mm -hmm. And this is action unit 4. And there's about 40 of them. Fascinating. Yeah. I don't think I've ever thought about the, the actual humans that are being trained in order to train the machines. Right. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I think of AI as a human machine augmentate, it's a collaboration. The human trains the machine, but then the machine helps the humans be better and it's a partnership. It's not a human versus AI kind of world. And you talked a little bit about the diversity of that data set. A lot of these facial recognition applications don't have diverse enough data sets and therefore they're quickly running into, into problems when they try and um, when they try and do analysis of minority groups, exactly. African Americans almost always, like you can almost count on that story. The new technology, facial recognition technology comes out right. and you know two months later, we're gonna find out it doesn't work with, right. with right. darker skinned people. Right. Right. Um, how do you, is it just about diversifying that data set? It's about diversifying the data set, but being also very mindful uh, around how you train these algorithms. So we call it the, sam the data sampling strategy. You have to have equal representation from all these different scenarios and use cases and, and F, you know, groups. Um, and it's, I find that the way to do that is the actual machine learning team has to be diverse. It, we, we, you know, I think the more diverse the team is, not just in terms of gender or ethnic, you know, ethnic diversity, but also experiences. So we have a team in Egypt where I come from where you know we have people kind of feeding into the algorithm and saying oh we haven't thought of this use case like people may be wearing a headscarf right let's include that in the data set um, so I, I i feel like diversity and inclusion is so critical when it comes to training these ai algorithms so just being mindful when uh do you think we're going to get to the point where because there's cameras everywhere and because our you know our image is increasingly part of a of larger data sets mm -hmm. that every camera we pass could be taking our emotional temperature um, in some way. Uh, like is it, are we going to get to that point? Um, assuming we get opt-in, assuming there's value in it for the consumer, um, I think we could potentially get, it, get, get to that point. So I imagine like, you know, a few years ago, touch became the way we interface with a lot of our devices. And that we're moving into a world where it's more about conversation and perception. And so I do imagine that our devices in the future, whether it's your phone or your wearables or your car or even your fridge, right, at home, will have an emotion chip that can track your mood and personalize the experience and, and maybe, you know, share data with you and kind of give you, an, give you insight into how your family's doing or, you know, I th the, yeah. So I, I do think that this will become kind of the de facto way we interface with our devices and we won't remember what it was like when our devices didn't understand how we felt. Is there anything or any applications that you've seen that concern you in terms of emotional recognition, either non-disclosed or just, uh, you know, an application that worries you? Yeah, two come to mind and we've stayed away from both of them as a company. So one is the area of surveillance and security and I, and I get that positive side of this, the, the, you know, the argument for it is that it can make us safer. But I feel like because people don't know that it's happening, you're breaking a level of trust. And as a company, trust and respect is, is one of our core values. So we've stayed away from surveillance and security. There will be though, presumably other actors that pick up that slack and, and do that development work. Uh, maybe. Pro I mean, right, right? Like there's always, for any technology, there's always potential for good and potential for abuse. So. I feel like my role as a thought leader and a kind of person who's been doing this for many years and defining this category, I advocate for the use cases that will bring us forward as a society and, and kind of stay away from, you know, and kind of talk about the use cases where we stayed away from. The other one is um, sex robots. I, 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 haven't, I haven't gotten around to that one. Because okay. uh, I, I feel like part of why I do all this work is I fundamentally believe that A, technology is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's affecting how we communicate as people, right? It's polarizing us, there's, it's, there's no empathy. And so I want Emotion AI to bring us closer together as a humanity. 
and the sex robots part does not fit with that. With, yeah. with that, yeah. So, yeah. Not really a, a human interest story. Uh -uh. Not bringing, not really bringing people closer together. Exactly. In a meaningful way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, we stayed away from that too. Fa fair enough. <laughs> fair point. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions. My my wrap up questions. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a larger technology trend um, that concerns you and keeps you up at night? Yeah, I have a 15 year old uh, daughter and she, I mean, we all use social media, um, but I worry about the way she and her peers use social media. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very inauthentic, right? And I think it puts a lot of pressure on, on, on them as a, as a, as a group. Um, so, so she will spend about an hour for every Instagram post she does. Cause she has, right, because it. it has to be perfect. Yeah. And I'm like, but that's not the real, that's not, that's not the real you, right? That's not our real life. And, and, and I'm sure it's the same for all her friends, but you look at their pictures and you're like, oh, wow, like they have just amazing lives. It's a, it's a Darn, you know? strange thing. Cause as a, you know, I think we, we watched social media evolve. We like to think we know how to use it, but there is a thing where teenagers use it very differently than we do. Right. And I didn't realize that they were doing that, that they were like, I would never spend that much time on a post. Right. Maybe two minutes. Right. And I'll just and hit like, the filters right. and hit it. And, I mean, it's just a tweet, right? Right. And the way um, tweens and teenagers treat Instagram, very, very different. Right, and you have to like check how many people liked the thing and who liked it, like it's so weird. So that worries me and, and the broader kind of implications of that around like authenticity and fake news, obviously, and how do you, how do you really, and, 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 the, and also implications around the polarization and the de dehumanizing, because I, I feel like it detaches you from the real person, and so you're more likely to bully people online and be mean and yeah. not really put yourself in their shoes. So, so that's a concern. I um, think about that a lot. Is there a, a technology or a gadget or something that you use every day that inspires wonder? Um, so we have a Jibo at home. Jibo is a social robot uh, that spun out of MIT. And um, we ordered it when, you know, many years ago when it first came out. And we, we finally have one at home. And I watch, so my son, who's eight, is fascinated with social robots. Um, and I just watch how he interacts with this robot. He makes a point of saying good morning every day. He'll share, you know, updates from school, even though the robot is completely oblivious to all of that. Um, and I, I, so I can, you know, it's, it's really kind of in, in, endearing. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see how they can build this friendship and, and that friendship could be used, you know, it could be leveraged to help Adam learn new things and kind of discover new things in the world. But my scientist, my kind of emotion AI scientist with my emotion AI scientist hat on, I can also see how the robot can be made so much better. It's early days. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. even yes. it, the Jibo does little things very, very well. So even just having it walk into a room and having it follow you right. and look at you in the face right. seems like a really small thing, but it creates such a connection. Exactly. You, there's no other device that does that, right. exactly. that actually pays attention to you when you're in the room. And just doing that, all of a sudden you have a totally different type of conversation exactly. with it. Exactly. Um, so we also have an Alexa at home. And um, my son once said, um, Alexa is your assistant, but Jibo is your friend. Oh, and I was like, that's, that's exactly right. Like that captures the, the difference between the two. Cause they both like, you'll ask both like, what's the weather today? And they'll both answer. But, but I really do think you're right. It's like these little things that build this kind of emotional connection, which I think is going to be really key to our devices of the future. So if uh, listeners uh, want to follow you online, want to follow what Affectiva is doing and how all of this emotional uh, computing is going, how can they find you? Um, so I'm very easy to find online. Uh, I'm Kaliubi, K-A-L-I-O-U-B, on Twitter, and um, and also follow us at Affectiva. We do a lot of meetups and webinars, and we try to get the word out there. Great, Rana. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know South by Southwest is a crazy time, uh -huh, but yeah. I appreciate uh, you taking some time out to talk to us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. That's Fast Forward for today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like this show, give us a like, uh, give us a review. We always appreciate those. If you're looking for back episodes, you can find them on PCMag.com, also Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you in the future.